as just said, and, and, and actually it's really nice, I've never had this luxury of, of following his, his uh, uh, loading uh, talk, but you've got to remember a lot of what he talked about when we start talking about crown diameters, when we talk about the genetics of trees, when we talk about what's functioning and why it's functioning, and, and it's a nice segue actually, uh, and again I've never had the luxury of, of, of following th that talk that we just heard with what you're about to hear. I have to give a couple of cautions on, on this talk. Uh, as Jess indicated, my, my uh, uh, professional training is as a phytosystematist, a plant taxonomist. I work with invasive species, forest botanist, and plant anatomist. Uh, I'm, I'm one of those people who wonders what's inside the tree. Why does it work the way it does? Um, we went yesterday, Jesse got us a, a, a tour through one of, the, one of the best field studies I think I've ever had at, in something very close by to here and I strongly recommend if you haven't seen it, you go and look at it and it's the Trappist Casket Company. It bothered me a little bit because they measured me for something, but um, and he said, you know, come, I want to take you through this and, and I, I don't know whether I should play too much into that or not, but uh, the, 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 the wood that talks to you in there and the, the grain and, and what we saw and if you're at all a woodworker, if you've ever whittled anything, it, it, it's, it's, it's pretty close to Mecca to see uh, those people doing that work. And a lot of what we saw yesterday and a lot of what we're going to see today and what you're going to look at on the slides is dictated by what's going on anatomically in that. He used the word a couple of times in his talk about the differences between trees. I talked about early on in my first talk about the differences in syrup. And he had a very important couple of statements in there that no two trees are alike. Take a moment and look across the table, look behind you, look around the room. You tell me if there's another person sitting here who looks exactly like you. That's genetics. Now, I did that once and I had a pair of identical twins. I mean, blew it all to the devil, but nevertheless, look around. And trees are no different. They're different by aspect, they're different by genetics, they're different by the competition that they have, and he's talked about all of that, so I don't have to. But let's talk. And because I am such an incredible professional, I really love this next slide, and it will, it will show you and ensure with you that I actually know what I'm talking about. This is how, this is how I'm told that, that in Vermont they gather sap, uh, and I, I, I particularly like this, this photograph, and I just use that as, 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 you know, an indication that I'm on the up and up, and this, you have to believe everything that I say along the way. Now, I'm going to take you again, just like beginning maple, I'm going to take you through our tree system. We all know what a maple tree is. We hopefully know what a maple tree is. But do we really? And I want you to think as we're going through this in your mind's eye, uh, a sapling maple, uh, a four inch maple, a 12 inch maple, and a 30 inch maple. He talked about, you know, the, the optimal crown diameters and that the, and I've got at the end of this talk some of those release slides. I don't have to go through those. He's already done that. But in your mind's eye, you've got this tree in front of you. You're standing there. You've got your hand on it. You're leaning on it at about five and a half feet. Four and a half feet is where you measure it. And that tree is, is the bowl. It is the, the, the trunk of the tree. It's the part of the tree that we tap. Now, in your mind's eye, let's, let's, let's make that that 12-inch tree. We've got a 12-inch tree standing there, no competition. It's, it's, it's a perfect tree. It's got a big crown on it. It's got a lot of tree underground, and we never really think a lot about that, and you need to. If you're going to maintain that B-class loading that he talked about in his stocking plan, you're going to have to take care of he talked with you about wind throw and, and, and releasing too quickly. He talked about sun scald on the south east side and the west side of that tree. But we never think about the part that we're standing on. And, and the extense, extensive part of that tree, you know, a, a better than a third of that tree is underground. 
And if you look at that 12 inch tree and you've all got that in your mind's eye right now, and you look at the, what do you talk about? A 30 inch spread of branches, you know, 15, 12, 15 feet on either side. You go to the end of those branches. I feel like I'm preaching up here, you know, and maybe I am. You go to the end of those branches and out here, that's referred to as the drip line. And you take that drop of water that drops off and it goes straight down. We usually assume that's the edge of the root mass going out. So not only, and he didn't talk about, not only are they competing for crown diameters and sunlight, but they're also competing for the soil matrix and the nutrients. And one of the most important things that we have in our sugaring industry and the longevity of our woodlots is availability of water. And that's totally dependent upon the underground part of that. So, I, uh, if we could turn the light on for a second, this part up here in front. I, I have to have you look at this. It's the lower left-hand corner that you see. I spent a tremendous amount of time for you people. You try doing this at home. You dig up a tree and you get it so that I come over and this is, you're done eating that, are you? Good, because I'm going to shake right on top of that. Nothing comes out of this. You try cleaning, cleaning the root mass of, this is a willow, by the way. I'm not going to nuke. He, he will kill a maple tree to save a walnut. I failed as a parent, I guess. But uh, it must be the pocketbook that's talking. You try cleaning the root mass of a, of, a, of a seedling tree and have it come this clean. This is about two days of retirees' work to get this, just so you could see. But there are a couple of extremely important parts of the tree that I want you to pay, take particular notion about and mention and carry home and be a little bit careful when you're working in your woods uh, and, and thinking about extracting sap and removing some of, he used the word, photosynthate, which is the sugars that that tree is producing. Now we're going to see here in a minute uh, Let's turn them back down again, and I'll have you turn it on again when we do the inside of the tree. The root masses of maples are, are there for several major functions. One is to take up water. That's probably the most important one. But equally important, it's there for something called anchorage. He talked about wind throw. That tree, those roots have got to help to hold that tree in place. This is a no-brainer. It's there for support. It's there for storage. We never think about that, but sap is stored. I want you to keep in your mind eye. We're going inside this tree. We're going to walk around among the cells. And those cells, a large number of them are dead at maturity. For a tree to function, there's a lot of dead wood in there. There's a lot of dead cells. It doesn't mean it isn't working, but they're dead. There's no living contents in it. And it's functioning at maturity, and the cells are dead. But there's a repository in this underground portion, in those underground portions. But the breadth of the root masses is dependent almost exclusively on environmental conditions. And it depends upon how deep your soils are, how close the hard pan or the bedrock is to the surface, how the soil structure is. If it's a heavy clay soil, the roots aren't going to penetrate as deeply as they would in gravel or sandy loams. So, depend, or on a rock face. Depending upon where your, your organisms are growing is going to determine just how far these root masses spread. Now these are two seedlings of about the same age. You'll notice right at this point, this tap root was cut off in the nursery. In order to be able to get seedlings shipped to someone to plant out, you don't want a great long tap root. White oaks are famous for that. If, you, if you've tried buying a white oak for your yard or something like that, They've all got their tap roots cut off because a white oak will put down a tap root about three feet in its first year of growth, and they're almost impossible to dig and to transplant. 
they don't transplant well either. So this one has been cut off and all of these side branches or lateral roots in many cases uh, have developed what is referred to as a fibrous root system. That's great for some support. A lot of the support of those 65 foot tall trees or 70 foot trees or 80 foot trees or 50 depending upon where you are uh, is dependent upon just like in a cornfield those plants, if you've got one corn stalk left in the middle of a 40 acre field, a wind comes through, it's gone. Same thing is true for your maple. They lean on one another. Jesse said they were friends with one another or there's sociology between them. I guess that's what you get when you get a college education. But nevertheless, these trees, this root system has become fibrous because of the hard pan that it was growing on. Now, those root systems are great, and this was the biggest tree in our sugar bush. Jesse was not very old when this was taken. You'll notice this was during sugaring. That's one of three wheeling buckets. I have a bent wheeling bucket for sale, by the way. That thing came over during sugaring in a, in a tornado that we had. I thought we were boiling that night, and I thought that the stack was going to come down on a wood-fired evaporator. But just beyond our sugar house, that, well, that's a, probably a, what, 11-inch diameter wheeling bucket. So that's a better than three-foot diameter maple tree. And the root mass on this was less than two feet. There wasn't a single tap root there. I've got Darien uh, clay loam soils. And the, the root mass was in excess of 20 feet in diameter when that thing tipped out of the ground. We continued to tap that tree, tipped over for two years before it finally died. And it continued, I, hey, if it's down, it's, got, it's alive, I'll tap it. It was a little funky having the taps go right angles of what they ought to be, but hey, nevertheless, it's sap. But that's what happens with the root systems. They adapt to their soil conditions. Adaptation is a genetic expression to differing environmental conditions. Wow, that was a profound statement. Genes working in the environment in which they are operating. Now, this is probably one of two of the most important slides in my entire talk. You got to tip sideways. I used to say that I said that, and people would always turn their heads sideways like this. But the, to the, your right is the, is the bottom part of a root. Now this is, and I apologize for the microscopy here, but I've got to get a little bit of technology into this and a little bit of vocabulary to get across my point. Out here on the tips of these finest roots, and you can't see this with the naked eye, on the tips in the current Listen to me for a second. Wake up, wake your neighbor up, have them look up here. This, uh, this is what Jesse's going to look like in 30 years, so get used to it, all right? You'll only see root hairs on this year's growth. Starting in February, when the soil temperatures begin to raise, you know, rise, you'll get an increase in the length of the hair roots, the branch roots. And out on the edge, this is the, this is the soil out here, all right? Out on the edge is a single cell, single wall cell that's alive at maturity. And this is one cell. I've outlined it in red. And those epidermal, epi upon skin, the outer, you have an epidermis on the outside of your, your body. There's an extension which is an extension of this cell. This one right here is an extension of the one behind. This is a single cell. And those are root hairs. Listen to me. That is the only place where every drop of water, back up, almost every drop of water, a good scientist never says always or never, it's where almost every drop of water who, that enters that 12 inch diameter tree, that's where it comes into the tree. And you're walking on it. You're driving your John Deere bulldozer on it. You're letting your cattle graze under that. That does damage 
just under the surface of the, of the soil to that growing most vulnerable part of that tree. Your entire sugar crop, your entire continuation of growth of that maple, every tree, is dependent upon those root hairs. There is an exception. If you're in swampy areas, some of the white pines, some of the larches, and some of the others do not have root hairs, uh, might have mycorrhizal or fungal associations that act as root hairs. But that is the most delicate part of that root system and it's a place where all of the water that functions in the support of that tree and in photosynthesis gets into that system. Okay, I've preached that one enough. So they're a single cell, that's just simply an extension of the cell wall. And in next year's growth, that root will continue to grow forward and what was right here will then become secondary growth. It will callus over, it will have a bark on it, and it will no longer uptake water. It will transport it, but it won't take it up. Now we know these things. Um, I, I told you in the last talk, it helps if it's a maple tree, if you're tapping it. Uh, things you want to take particular note, and I brought some sugar maple branches with me. Sharp buds, the important thing to look at on, on winter, winter uh, determination, and Jesse says that you, you've got to know the trees that you're, you're dealing with, is the bark characteristics. They change until a tree is about 25 years old, again, depending upon where it's growing, it's going to have smooth bark. It's not going to look like the 12-inch maple tree with a rough bark on it, or in this case, a black maple, which has a much tighter bark than a sugar maple. Uh, but you look for very sharp pointed buds and, and take particular note and remember this terminal bud and if you can see them back there, those, those whitish scales that you see on this bud, we're going to talk about those and the modification of those as leaves. You want to look at the attachment of where the leaves came into it. All maples, I think all maples, with the exception of one, the box elder is a maple, that, that has a single uh, palmately netted leaf. This is a typical sugar maple leaf. Box elder have compound leaves. You can tap those. Um, I wouldn't suggest it. They have almost no sugar and they make pretty black syrup. Uh, but the attachment of the leaves on the stem is opposite in the maples. And we've got a slide now. Well, that's that bud. We'll come back to that. This is alternate arrangement. That's not a maple. That's a basswood. But an important point, all attachments of leaves to stems on the upper side of the attachment is something referred to as an axillary bud. It's the bud in the axle made between the leaf and the stem. Leaves anatomically are modified stems, okay? They're annual modified stems. There are only a few organisms on Earth uh, tree organisms that have leaves that hang them around for more than a single growing season. In our environment, there are not many. You've got some oaks where the abscission, that's a high flutin term for the zone where it breaks off. The abscission zone occurs right here, and that's what allows the leaf to fall off from the tree in the, in the late, this time of year, late uh, autumn. Uh, on some trees it does not form. Some trees it's affected by street lights. You'll see pin oaks uh, and some of the bur oaks will not lose their leaves. There probably is a street light close by and it, it, it screws up the uh, formation of that, that drop zone, if you will. But these axillary buds actually are the location of next year's branch growth or they may be on some fruit trees, or even on these trees, may be flower buds for next year. So there's a whole, whole uh, uh, terminology that we're not going to get into with respect to um, uh, buds and bud arrangements. This is a maple, uh, and the, the important point here is the attachment of the leaves are opposite one another. There are three types of attachment. Alternate, where they zigzag up the stem. Opposite, where they are across from each other, and then whorls, W-H-O-R-L-E-D, where they are like the branches on a Christmas tree, where there are five of them, five uh, leaves whirled. Um, you don't have a lot of whorled in, in broadleaf. Uh, there are a few uh, herbaceous plants, but not a lot of trees that I know of. 
Um, the difference between sugar maples, reds, and Norways are the lenticels. Now, lenticels are, are openings between the outside air and the inside of the stem. We might get into that a little bit when we get into the internal anatomy, but allow for gas exchange between the inside of the stem and the outside of the stem. Uh, they're not particularly prominent in Norway maples. Norway, whole, I'm not even going to ask for a show of hands if you're tapping Norway's. I wouldn't do it. Nor they may be, I'm not going to say what I was, I was going to say, they might be toxic, but I, mean, I can't prove that. Uh, Norway's will have a milky latex. They make the most foul tasting syrup you've ever had. If your only tree you have in your yard, which in most parts of the world, and I'm on the Federal Invasive Species Council, Norway's are invasive plants. Um, so I wouldn't be planting those and I wouldn't suggest you try tapping them. But red maple, they have multiple axillary buds, which you see in these axles. There was a leaf here, there was a leaf there, there was a leaf there and there and there. That's a leaf scar. But we're getting into anatomy that I don't think we need to cover here at this point in time. Now, Jesse talked about this. And again, I'm sliding some things in before we get inside the tree. Tap hole closure is important. And I, 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 he's okay in what he said because he's in the room. Uh, if he stepped out, I would disagree with him. Uh, your tap holes today, especially if you're tapping with, you can't see it from here, but if you're tapping with a 5 16 inch tapping bit, 1964 inch bit, these tap holes should close within four months, five months. Your tap holes on your 5 16 inch tapped trees should close by hunting season of the year in which you tapped them. If they're not, you might be, as he said, over tapping. There might be a little bit of decline. This was, and I took this just before I came here, that was this year's tap hole. Okay, that closed in since, and I tapped on about the 10th of January. So that closed completely. This one is two years out. Now, this one, you can see if you look very closely and squint a little bit or just dream, there is some closure starting there and there. And it will look like a shade or a door closing, a pocket door closing. I'm not too worried about that one. I will be worried come next year if that tap hole isn't completely closed. And it may not. This tree is next to a roadway and I think too many four-wheelers uh, and their roots exposed. I think too many tractors have gone down through there. And that tree may be actually firewood for the, uh, for the evaporator in a few years. Uh, or if it tips over, I'll tap it sideways, you know, for a couple of years until I've drained every bit of sap out of that poor thing. Now, there's a problem here, a little too aggressive. You don't want to, and, and these I took in Joe's woods when I, yeah, he didn't hear. He's talking with Jess, so that's not true. These are actually in my woods. But this is what happens. I'd like to blame Jess or somebody on this, but this is what happens. Remember I said if you're tapping at 25 degrees or 10 degrees, you shouldn't be out there at 10 degrees above zero. Your fingers get too cold. But also the tree is frozen. And if you tap that, no pun intended, you hit that spile just that one tap more, it will cause a very tiny crack up and down. And it's always, of course, it's up and down because that's the way the rays are. It will take, this will take 20 years to completely grow over. You don't want to see a frost. This one was not over tapping. That's actually, it went to about 30, negative 30 F. And with that, that uh, plastic spile in that tree, that tree just expanded and it's, it split itself. Uh, I'm not going to take, take the blame for this one. This one is, I don't know whether I drove it too hard or not, uh, but nevertheless, it's, it's simply hitting it too hard. One of the tools that I hope Joe talks about, and I didn't bring mine because bringing things on the plane is a little bit suspect, and when you see some of these things, it's a wonder I got through T TSA with some of them. I carry a pair of old channel lock fence pliers and nothing heavier. You shouldn't use anything heavier than a six ounce hammer. I won't, I won't let a hammer in my woods. 
You use a pair of fence pliers with the beak ground off from it so you can get it out of your pocket without ripping your pocket. You don't need the beak on it anyway. And you use the side of the pliers. If you're, if you're new to tapping, there will be a feel to it. You don't grab onto it and wham the living daylights out of it. You tap it until the pliers bounce and don't tap it again. If you do, you'll split the bark. You split the bark. You've done, he talked about the vascular cambium. We're going to see it later on. It is a single layer of cells that surround this tree. Think of your 12 inch tree, the round of it. Think of a plastic sleeve that you're bringing from the base of the tree all the way to the top of the tree, out every branch. That plastic sack, like a bread bag, is one cell thick the entire height and the entire branch arrangement, the entire root arrangement of that tree. The vascular cambium is that one cell thick layer of, here comes a big word, parenchyma cells. Parenchyma is Greek for para-enchyme, which means to pour in around, to fill in around. Every cell in that 12 inch diameter tree, Every cell started out as a living, highly dividable parenchyma cell. And then it differentiated into xylem and phloem and bark and leaf cells and palisade parenchyma, root hair cells. Every one started out as a brick-shaped, that's not true. That's not true at all. They're not brick-shaped, they're not round. Got any, do I, it's not rectangular. Do I have any botanists in the room? There's a beautiful term. I'll, I'll write it down for you at lunchtime. You can drop this in polite company and people's eyes will glaze right over. The perfect fit, and it actually cost, uh, here go off on a tangent. It, it actually cost the federal government about $70,000 40 years ago to come up with something called the best fit model. And it's what is the shape of the best fit cell in plant systems. Here you go. It's an orthic tetrachi decahedron. <laughs> you all knew that, didn't you? That's a 14-sided structure with eight, six quadrilateral, rectangular, as somebody said, uh, six and eight, uh, and eight uh, uh, orthogonal cells, uh, eight-sided, eight octagonal cells. Anyway, that's the best fit model, and that's what they look like. So every one of them's alive. Now, Jess, I need the lights again. And I need some help. I need, okay, your parenchyma. Okay. I have had trouble, you can't see that now. But this is, together with Dean, here, slide that right down through there, right in here. No, yeah, right, right there. Yeah, no, no. You're not done. Okay. You gotta hang on to this, okay? Now what we have here, and I got this on the plane, believe it or not, sharp sticks, the whole works. But this is the vascular system of the inside of the tree. And I'll catch you in a second. Okay, thanks. What Dean has put in here is the only living cells. Now, we're inside the tree. Okay, we've got a cookie of a tree. This is right out of the center of one of Iowa's finest. Okay, and a big one. There are four kinds of cells inside the bowl of this tree. Jesse talked about the cookie of a tree, the round section of the tree. If you look at that, the bark on the outside, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the phloem. Then we're going to talk about that layer of vascular cambium that is just inside the phloem and just outside the wood. Now wood is largely dead at maturity like about 30% of the people in this room right now who are dead <laughs> and asleep. I, I got these whips, I'm gonna whip people with these, okay? So I, I wanted to make a, a, a model of exactly what was inside the tree. And when we turn the lights off in a minute, you're going to see, looking at the end, vessel elements 
which are open, right? You can see that. I can poke your eye out with one of these fibers. I went to a forestry meeting and lost my eye to a fiber, okay? Fibers are, or uh, vessel elements are the big glumping cells, okay? They look like pop cans, and that's what I used to use. When I did Joe's talk up in, in, uh, in the upper part of um, central Wisconsin a year ago, I used pop cans and piled them up. That's what vessel elements are. Tracheids, which are halfway between fibers, these, these willow whips, and vessel elements, are not hollow, but are dead at maturity. So vessel elements are dead, tracheids are dead, fibers are dead, and Dean's parenchyma, which he put in here, is not going up and down, but is going out. Now, little test here. If, if, if dad, dad you know, cuts up chunks of firewood and he sends you and your brother out to split the firewood and one is American elm and one is white ash and you're younger than your brother but you're faster than he is and you know you got to split all this firewood so you run to the pile and you can't come in and get you know cookies and whatever until you're done which blocks of wood are you going to split and beat your brother out on why why are you going to take the ash one because it's got emerald ash borer in it but what are you talking about? Straighter grain. Elm, I mean, you can't, even with the best wood splitter. Um, it's got uh, cells in it are um, straight up and down. So when you start to split it, the cells will break apart easily. And the elm doesn't have that, does it? Not easily. And your brothers are much bigger than you are, too. So. Uh, and, he, and he's exactly right. Those cells that he was talking about are ray cells. They're parenchyma. They're the only living cells in this otherwise dead wood. And in ash, and we'll see, a, it's called a tangential view. And my wife said, you got to explain to them what a tangential view is. So in the round of the wood, and each one of you have got a round cookie of wood you're sitting at. If we split a piece off from this round and we look in this way that's a tangential view and when you look at it that way you're looking at this and what he is splitting is he's hitting that in white ash and there are a million of them in there and it will pop that right apart not so in maple not so in 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 hickory particularly especially bitter hickory which is horrible stuff to split plus it stinks but it just simply, they're, they're there, but they're not arranged like they are in Abraham's uh, white ash tree, which splits nicely. Okay, so we've got a combination of vessel elements, tracheids, and these willow whips are fibers. Now think about that. And we, I should have three plants here, and I put on your table little cookies of grapevines. I want you to take those with you when you go to lunch. They've got some sap in them, so they're a little sticky. And I've got a couple of dead ones up here that are big. You should be able, unless you all came with your, uh, with, with your hand lens with you, and I'll loan you mine if you want to see this. But with your naked eye, you should be able, if you get the right light, you can actually, with your unaided eye, you can see down in the vessel elements. Grapevines are almost exclusively vessel elements. When's the last time you saw a grapevine stand by itself 40 feet tall? They're 40 feet up in the tree, but they're using that tree for support. So keep that in mind. It's all vessel elements, and these things by themselves are not, these may break, so be a little bit careful. I could hurt you here, you know. These things do not like to pile up and hold themselves easily. So what we do is bundle them together with tapered ended tracheids. Now these are attached, remember? They're hollow. They transport a tremendous amount of water. You cut a grapevine off this time of year, the water will run right out of it, all right? 
Same thing is true for large vessel elemented wood. These will transport water the full length, okay? These, these pockmarked measles that you've got on the outside are called pits. And there are pits that adjoin pits on the tracheids. And so there's water transport from the vessel element to the tracheid. The sloped end walls of, I can tell you people really care a lot about this. I get excited about these things. These things will transport water. And every drop of sap that's going up and down your maple tree is going through this circuitous route of motion up through these dead cells. All right? The greater, the denser the wood, the more there are these things which are were parenchyma cells that elongated, died, and these have no water conducting potential whatsoever. But this is what gives white oak its strength, bamboo its resiliency, maple its hardness, the fibers are what are, are giving the end support as well as the side support. And Dean's parenchyma cells are what are allowing for water transport from the inside of the tree out to the bark. So you put all of those things together. Now we can kill the lights and I stand between you and lunch. We've only got an hour left before you eat lunch. Don't look at your watches. And so we have the vessel elements that I, drew, I showed you with the open end walls. The, 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 these are fibers, the great long things, and then the tracheids which have the tapering end walls. My grapevine can't stand by itself because they are all, or largely all, fibers and, and vessel elements. Our maple trees are a nice combination, we'll see it in a minute, of vessel elements, tracheids, and fibers. What are the tallest trees on earth? Sequoias, redwoods, um, um, Douglas yeah, Douglas firs. I'm trying to think of the ones in the upper Midwest or in the upper West. Um, doesn't matter. Uh, the loblollies, all of those, they're all conifers. No conifer, that's not true. Almost no conifers have vessel elements. There are a couple in, in Australia that do have, but we may throw them out of the, the, the coniferophyta but they are all tracheids and fibers. So the tallest trees on earth, and if you really want to get a Nobel Prize in botany, you come up with the concept of how do you get water? This is another confounding thing I want you to take away from this plant anatomy lecture, is how do you get water to the top of a 300 foot tall tree? Don't answer that right immediately. Whisper it to me and I'll, you and I'll publish it together and I'll leave your name off. Uh, it's confounded scientists forever. Joe will sell you a hugely expensive mink claw bush vacuum pump or whatever it is you sell, Joe, but I don't care what it is. The best vacuum pump on earth hooked to an inch pipe will draw water how far? Again? 33 feet in a perfect world. I don't care how good the pump is, it isn't going to do it. 33 feet. That's all you can do. Now I told you a few minutes ago that that entire tree is full of water. That tree, our maple trees, are 60, 70, 80 feet tall. The sequoia is 300 and some feet tall. How do it know? And how does it get water to the top of it? Now, we don't have enough time in this month for me to explain that, uh, but it is, it is a very, very important concept and deals a lot with these cells. Okay, they, those were, were Dean's ray cells right here and Abraham's splitting cells. That's what he put his ax down through and that's what allowed that white ash to split apart. If you look at, and these are real cells, these are the vessel elements. These are the fibers, and these are, see the tapered end walls? Those are the tracheids. They all work together. 
Now, the bowl of that tree, Jesse, help me, a, a 65 foot tall tree without its leaves, uh, take the roots out of the ground and the bowl of the tree, what's that thing going to weigh? Two ton? More. More than two ton? Whatever, figure it out. What percent of that 12 inch, 65 foot tall tree with a massive root system on it, what percentage of the cells in that tree are alive when it's functioning right now? We go out, I, probably the sisters would be upset if we went out and dug up a 12 inch tree in the front yard. But we were doing it for science. We took it out and you stripped all of the cells out of that. What percentage of that tree is alive? The cells are alive at mature. The tree's alive. 20%? 10%. Less than one. Jeez, it sounds like a farm auction. You're in the right area, okay? Depends upon the tree, depends upon the size, depends upon, you know, what's growing, you know, if it's, if it's a buckthorn or, or some other weed tree that we've got, probably it's more than that's alive. Uh, but the idea is that most of that tree, when it's functioning, is dead. Every bit of that is dead at maturity, even probably by the time it's that big, the ray cells are dead. Okay. Now, I need to have you look at this. This is, is not maple. This is actually a conifer. These are resin ducts out here. But the point is, this was the pith in the center of the stem in the first year's growth. This is the first year's secondary xylem. This was wood. This is dead at maturity. This is the second year, all right, year two, year three. We refer to these as annual increments. Jesse talked about growth. When, remember when I said I'm tapping through 10 years of growth? He talked with you about uh, eighth inch growth rings, a quarter inch growth rings. Uh, these would be in that range. And so what you're getting is right here is that vascular cambium. So from the vascular cambium, the bread bag in is wood or xylem. That's what these things are over here as I take your eyes out with a laser pointer. That's what this stuff that I was trying to explain, that's what all of the, the, the amalgamation of these things together are all of these things in cross section. Where'd that go? Jeez, I'm losing my vessel a little. Let's, all right. You're tapping soft maple, aren't you? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, I'm not. But, but that one cell thick layer, that bread bag, as you referred to it, is, is visible to the naked eye, isn't it? If you peel this off, yeah. you've got to go in, you've got to go in with your little, and you, you look right at it, right there. Yes, it'll be green in some, it'll be clear in some. It's one cell thick. Now, when Jesse was talking about, and you saw the saw marks on the tree, he said cut them down, especially if you've got tubing in there. When you girdle them, you want to get in past this, and you've got to girdle it all the way around or it's going to heal. That's the place where the growth, this will continue to grow out, all right? What it's laying down to the inside of that green line is wood is xylem. To the outside is phloem. And this phloem is where the sugar that is produced in last growing season is translocated, is transported to not just to the roots. The old concept in your funky high school biology teacher, which probably never sat in my class. I'm far enough away from home I can say that. That's good. This is good. Uh, We'll get several of those. Hi. Oh, I thought he was waving to me. That's people think that the you know the sap goes to the roots in the in the winter time and then comes back up during the spring. You've got to dispel that. If 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 that's the case, that puppy is dead, because that tree is never ever without sap. 
all right? And if it is, it is not going to be for long. You're going to kill it. So what you're doing is getting conversion of those sugars in the off season uh, from starches to sugars back in the spring, and that's what we go in and tap. Your questions are good, and we'll continue that conversation. All right. Oh, that's a nice slide. That's a snowstorm. That's the seven feet of snow we had in Buffalo. You've seen this. Again, the idea is that the 10%, 2% uh, of that tree is alive. The rest of it is, is dead. I want you to be mindful of the load. And we're going to talk about leaves in just a minute. Uh, and that's, those are cells lost every year. That's a tremendous energy loss to that tree. Um, but we'll move on with that. I think you all know that concept. This is what, and it's green too, guys. Hey, Abraham, others. This is what you, you indeed were talking about, the vascular cambium. It's usually not that green, but that's exactly what's happening. The cells that get laid down to the left of that green sheet will become wood. The cells that get laid down to the right of the green sheet will become uh, phloem. And then there actually, I cheated a little bit, there's another, another right here called cork cambium. And whenever you see the word cambium, it means new growth. It's like the apical meristem, where all of the forward growth on a branch occurs at the top and the apical meristem on the roots. So there basically are, are, are four, four as I hold up ten fingers, four growing regions in a tree. Vascular cambium is a big one for wood and for phloem. Um, cork cambium produces nothing but new bark and the apical, aerial apical meristem forward growth on branches and on the apex of the tree and apical meristem at the end of every root. We've already done this. This is exactly what we talked about with the models over here and the, the ray cells running at right angles to the, the flow of water up and down is in this direction. Down is towards the roots, up is the, uh, the top of the tree. Quick question, count these up. How many annual rings are here? And our annual rings, are we counting like this? Or are we counting like this? How many annual rings? Four. 20 or four? four? Four. Left hand has four. Anybody here on this side want equal time on 20? How do I know that these are annual rings? Easy way is that they're curved. All right, the other ones are the ray cells that they were talking about. And what you've got from right here to right here is one annual increment. This was, is called spring or early wood. This is called late wood. And you see how the cells are so much smaller? This is September, October. Trees do not go dormant with respect to cell growth. They slow down at 19 degrees below zero in, in, in Merrill, Wisconsin, but they don't go dormant. The people do, but the trees don't. Gotcha, Joe. Yeah. Tangential section, I told you about. This is what Abraham's axe is going through when he's splitting wood. Now, I said that, and I got really passionate about that root hair and the uptake of water. The second cell that is on my favorite list is these. Up and down, they're at right angles to this. This is a leaf, okay? Surface of the leaf, upper surface, lower surface. I'm going to come back to these stomas or stomatas. Uh, that's for gas exchange. But these cells are Dean's parenchyma cells, but they're filled with green. You would not be sitting here today if it weren't for a green plant. You ate green plants when you had those pastries. I saw some of you took two of those, by the way. Those, the, <coughs> the flower that went into that was a green plant. The clothing that you're wearing, unless it's spun out of nylon or rayon or whatever, came from a green plant. Even that did if it's a petrochemical. The chlorophyll that is in those palisade parenchyma cells are what allow you to make maple syrup. It is those cells, this is going to be profound, get ready for it. Chlorophyll, which is a catalyst. Chlorophyll, catalyst, you know, the cat, you know what a catalyst is, everybody? A catalyst is that, that little shrimpy guy that, that sneaks in and gets a fight started in a room and then 
he ducks out, and while everybody else is beating each other up, the, the, the catalyst leaves. You know, he doesn't enter the fight at all, but he lives for another day to go start another fight. Chlorophyll is the catalyst. Catalyst is there, it, ex it absorbs and accepts the rays of sunlight. So chlorophyll, in the presence of sunlight, together with water and carbon dioxide, exhale deeply. Thank you. You just fed a plant. Chlorophyll, in the presence of sunlight, in the presence of water and carbon dioxide, will produce C6H12O6, or some variant, which is sugar, and water, and what? Inhale. And thank a green plant for that. Oxygen. And that's why we tap trees. And that's why we go in and steal what Jesse referred to as photosynthate. And it's all done right in that palisade parenchyma. Now, this is an electron micrograph of one of those stomas or stomatas of a maple tree. And that allows for the exchange of gases, CO2 into the leaf and oxygen out. It's a phenomenal mechanism. Now, this is a geranium stomate. This one is closed. Well, you can see that, can't you? And this one is? And what those are, those specialized cells that you see right there, these things are called guard cells. Now watch, here's a guard cell. This is a guard cell. You with it? This is not an obscene gesture, okay? This is a guard cell. This is a guard cell. These guard cells, I gotta get my thumbs out of there. These guard cells are turgid. They're full of water. They look like a kidney bean or two slices of a cantaloupe, all right? When these guard cells begin to lose moisture, okay, it's the middle of the day, it's hot, there's not a lot of liquid out there, and they lose moisture, they do this. Those guard cells lose turgidity, moisture, they close, and that shuts down the loss of water vapor from the inside of the, the leaf. Photosynthesis stops, so the left-hand side is closed. It's, it's middle of the day, it's hot, it's losing water. It's a, it's a mechanism. You've been, you folks have corn here, don't you? You drive by a cornfield, they tell me that you had a drought most of the summer, and you saw corn leaves rolled right up, all right? That's a mechanism which shuts down on the loss of water from the plant. Not only do the stomates close, but the leaf curls and reduces its surface area. No, those are a different cell that's doing that, but it's all working in tandem. A great mechanism and one which, again, drives our process. That's the tree Jesse wants us all to have in our sugar bushes. You notice there's no competition there. Open grown trees, they've got sugar like you wouldn't imagine. I'm not going to spend time on this. He's already done that one. This is my favorite slide and it comes from your state and I stole it and I really appreciate it. If you're not familiar with this, this uh, tree, a uh, bur oak in Audubon County, um, and I don't think this is just uh, urban legend. Everybody done reading that? All right. There's the clevis point for one side of the plow and on the other side of the tree is the mold board. And, and it tells you something about the incredible growth of a tree over 130 years. I truly appreciate your having me come. There's all sorts of information. I'm, tr I am, I'm actively plugging the maple syrup manual, which you can't buy right now. And we are in the process and we would like to have you weigh in on these sorts of things, on whether or not something like this, and you can take a look at this, you can take a look at this, don't take it, because it's our only copy. Um, but we're in the process, it takes years to produce these things. There's all sorts of information available. Uh, they handed out when you registered the insert to the maple syrup digest. I've talked with several of you here. I will be unashamedly uh, unbiased and, and not at all worried about it. 
I would strongly encourage, especially with the, the USDA funding coming to your three states, uh, actually to the six states in the upper Midwest, Indiana has an organization. Wisconsin is a member of the North American Maple Syrup Council, which publishes the Maple Digest that you see up here and the inserts that are now being put into these. You folks need to get yourself organized, either Illinois and Iowa together. I'd be more than happy to help you do that, but it, it gives you the Maple Digest, it gives you a seat at the table, and you folks and your woodlots truly deserve it. Thank you for having me. Thank mm -hmm. you.